We are recording. Okay. All right. Shall I take it off? Please. Okay. Welcome, everybody. It's a real pleasure to have Victoria Booth here as the speaker with us, and she's following up rhythms for us, which is uh, which is fantastic. And uh, Victoria did her PhD in North Northwestern, and then she, she was already interested in, math, math, in biology, but, but her PhD was in mathematics, on general mathematics. And then she did a postdoc at the NIH with John Drenzel, um, and then started her first faculty position at NJIT before moving to Michigan, where she has been since then. Um, her, she, her work on sleep-wake rhythms is, um, is very prominent and it's an important role in understanding sleep, and that's what she will talk to us today about. Thank you very much, Victoria. Looking forward to it. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. So let's see. Let me get my screen shared. OK. <clears throat> Are we seeing the screen? OK. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. And um, I'm, so I'm going to, I, I saw on your schedule when, um, that you had Albert Goldbader last week. And so you learned all about circadian rhythms. So I thought, okay, I'll follow up and talk a little more about circadian rhythms. And then our focus on circadian rhythm modulation of sleep uh, and sleep-wake patterns. So um, I'd like to start with uh, acknowledging my collaborators in this work. So this work is joint work with um, Cecilia Denise Ben, who's um, in the math department at uh, Colorado School of Mines. And then um, much of the stuff I'll talk about today is the work of a graduate student, Christina Athanasuli, at the in the Applied Math uh, graduate program at University of Michigan with me. Okay, so, um, so you're, well, you're probably thinking a lot about sleep these days. It's not that since last week you heard about circadian rhythms, but then also because this happened this week and I know I'm missing this, this hour of sleep. And um, so back in 1918, they seemed really gung ho about um, changing the clocks to get this extra hour of daylight and not really sort of thinking about what does that do to everybody physiologically and why we feel so rotten um, this week when you're trying to wake up um, uh, uh, an hour earlier. Um, so I'll just, let's just take a moment to sort of think about like, okay, what is it? Why do we feel so terrible about this week of trying to, trying to shift our clocks um, in an hour? And so, um, so thinking about it at the highest level of what is governing and modulating our sleep-wake patterns, there's two primary factors. And you heard a lot about the main one. I'm, I'm assuming you heard a lot about the, the, one of the, the first one last week from Albert Goldbader which is the circadian clock or the circadian rhythm. So um, we've got lots of 24 hour, um, lots of processes in our body that are modulated over the 24 hour day, including blood pressure, body temperature, um, as well as um, alertness and, and the propensity for sleep. And these are governed by the, um, the mat, what's called thought to be the master pace, pacemaker um, in the brain, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, whose individual cells each have a 24 hour molecular clock, which I'm assuming that's what you, you heard all about modeling of that, that uh, intracellular uh, protein tr uh, transcription translation clock from um, Albert. Um, and so, the, um, so there's the circadian clock that governs our propensity for sleep and waking and uh, you know, alertness and propensity for sleep. And then the other, the other kind of more most primary kind of process is the homeostatic sleep drive. And the homeostatic sleep drive is this you know, unavoidable need for sleep after we've been awake for a long time. And um, um, what's interesting is that even though you know, we all experience this every single day. And basically every mammal also experiences um, uh, need, this need for sleep as well as most um, uh, organisms that, are, that, that um, uh, people have been looking for sleep. They find it in fish and they find it in fruit flies. But what's interesting is that the actual physiological mechanism causing this, this, this basically the the phenomenon of getting tired is not completely known. The, the leading candidate in what they is the, is the idea that, um, that there's a buildup of a cellular byproduct called adenosine that um, 
uh, there are parts of the brain that can uh, detect um, or individual uh, populations of neurons in the brain that can detect adenosine and those neurons seem to be most active during sleep. So, um, and the other piece of, of, of um, sort of evidence that to, towards adenosine is that caffeine blocks the effects of adenosine um, in these, on these, these areas of the brain that are, that are related to sleep. So, um, so usually, you know, under normal circumstances, the circadian clock and the basically the homeostatic sleep drive are kind of entrained, entrained so that we're, we're, um, uh, are, are we have most promotion for waking during the daylight and promotion for sleep um, during it during night. Um, and but 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 they can get disrupted and desynchronized the sleep drive and the circadian clock, especially like during jet lag and then during this time when we have um, this change of the clocks and we're trying to trying to uh, shift our schedule and why in thinking about why um, the 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 spring ahead that we're we're experiencing now is so much more painful than the fall back that we do in the fall um, we can get a clue from it from these these um, early experiments that were done when people were first um, investigating the circadian rhythm and the circadian clock. And they would do these experiments where they would take individuals and isolate them from all environmental time cues. So basically have them live in a kind of bunker where they were, they, they didn't, they were isolated from any of the daylight or nighttime time cues from the, from the world or from, from anybody else in, in society or environment to know when, you know what what time of day it was and they could choose their own schedule and then and the, so here's a this is some um, data from one such individual where down on the y-axis is time and day so they spent at least 30 days in this isolated bunker setting their own time and what they tracked over the days um, which are you know individual days are double plotted here in the two columns. They track their sleep wake patterns, so the bars represent their sleep pattern when they went to sleep, and they also track their um, body temperature. And these black triangles are the minimum of the body temperature. So when the circadian rhythm and the sleep wake pattern are entrained, we basically uh, the body temperature minimum usually occurs in the middle of or sort of near the end of the sleep phase. So sort of like, you know, three or four in the morning, usually kind of, you know, if you keep a regular kind of um, sleep schedule. And so what we can see here um, that under this um, isolation protocol, that for the first, say, two weeks, the, the this individual was able to keep, a you know, their their temperature minimum still occurring during their sleep period, although there was this, there's a, a lot of, of variability there. But what we notice is that their period of sleep wake, you know, so their, of, of their time period of the sleep wake cycle is a little longer than 24 hours, as well as the time period of their circadian, their, their circadian minimum or their body temperature minimum. So what this, what this, what this uh, shows is that our natural clock, our natural circadian clock is a little bit longer than 24 hours. And so, so in now in the spring ahead, what we have to do, we're trying to, we're not shifting our time clock in the way that would, we would naturally like to shift, which would be to delay. Instead, we're trying to advance, which makes it so, so painful. Um, um, so um, uh, I'd like to point out some other, another part of this from, uh, you know, um, feature of this data is that you can see that the, the, the circadian clock actually sort of maintained its rhythm. So that's what you, you heard about Albert Gobet are talking a lot about last week, I'm sure about that there's this intrinsic period from the, from the SCN, but the sleep-wake pattern can get very desynchronized. However, the sleep-wake pattern still maintains, like, maintains a cycle. And so in a way what we can, what this shows is some of the underlying, or not underlying, I would say sort of the, the highest level dynamics that are happening between sleep-wake behavior and circadian rhythm are the fact that they're coupled oscillators. Or we can think of them as 
but we can think of them as coupled oscillators. And this was recognized early on when people started to talk about, uh, investigate um, sleep wake and circadian rhythms. All right, so what we're gonna talk, what I was gonna talk about today is some of the mathematical modeling that we've been doing about how the circadian rhythm and the homeostatic sleep drive interact and influence the timing of, of sleep-wake behavior. And so I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some of the um, models the, that we've been built, that we've been constructing for um, sleep-wake behavior and the neuronal control of sleep-wake states. And then, and then talk about how we've, um, in, in an effort to figure out how can we analyze what the dynamics of the models are or bifurcations of the models, we turn to the classic, um, a classic technique of circle maps. And um, I think in the audience, we have some, some people who have done a lot of early work on, on um, some of these uh, circle maps and some of these dynamics. So it's great to, um, great to have them, great to have them here. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about sleep to get into like, how are we gonna build a model for sleep-wake states? Oh, I forgot. So I thought I figured I'd put in my main motivation for why do we care about, why are we gonna care about the types of um, uh, solutions and bifurcations that these sleep-wake models can have? And so this was this, uh, this is, I found this on the internet. And this is um, some actual data from a PhD neuroscientist who recorded the sleep patterns of her newly born infant over nine months. So every day, so that, so we've got we've got on the x-axis basically days. You can kind of see the 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 um, date date stamp on the bottom, and on the y-axis is 24 hours. And if we basically each uh, column in this in this kind of raster plot indicates when the baby was asleep and when the baby was awake. And the dark the dark bars are when the baby was asleep. And so, um, you know, thinking about what what this shows is, and as everybody who's who's had had children knows, is that that early in life there is not much of a pattern at all in terms of the sleep wake cycles with the 24 hour day, very, um, uh, you know, almost random. It's hard, it's hard to pick out a, a real pattern or it's very variable day to day, but eventually, you know, over a couple months, sleep starts to consolidate and, and wake starts to consolidate. So there's a mainly, you know, the, the bulk of waking happening in the middle of the day with some naps. And eventually, you know, the, 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 we get their children trained to take sort of naps at predictable times. And we can see this. So by, by nine months, this baby was ended up where, where they slept, they did pretty well sleeping through the night, and then would have two naps during the day. And then, then we think about, okay, then what we know what happens as the baby gets older is that they would eventually drop one of the naps and, and consolidate to a, to a sleep pattern where you'd have one nap during the day. And then, you know, later on after, you know, being three or four years old or, or something before that, two or three years old, they'll drop the nap in the middle of the day to, to, get, to get to the sort of the, the standard adult sleep cycle that humans have of one, one um, sleep cycle per day. And so what we've been, we've been thinking about, what, what, thinking about with our models, one thing lately thinking about is like, well, what is, what is this transition and how does this transition happen? And how does this trend, how does the model, um, uh, how, can, how can the models provide for these kind of transitions that happen, these sort of transitions in, in sleep patterns that happen you know, very, very um, uh, clearly in early stages of life, but then also in later stages of life, then during aging, there's also often a sleep fragmentation where sleep is not as consolidated um, uh, uh, during the night. So, so that's sort of, that's been our, our motivation or our recent motivation of the work we've been doing you know, with these models. Okay, so now, now we'll dig into deep about the models. Okay, so let's just quickly um, review about sleep. Uh, so sleep isn't a homogeneous state over the night. We've got different stages of sleep. And in humans, we can um, uh, identify the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. And this is where dreaming occurs, as well as four um, stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep. And basically through the night, as this cartoon is, or sort of schematic is showing, so we've got time on the x-axis, through the night we cycle between these different sleep stages. 
where here the line, the y-axis gives the, um, the behavioral state of waking, the four stages of non-REM sleep, and then REM sleep in these black bars. And basically through the night, there's like a 90 to 100 minute uh, cycle for, for episodes of, of, of REM sleep. So, but what's causing these different transitions or these different sleep stages and then the transitions between the, stage, between the stages? So um, recently uh, there's been a lot of experimental work identifying different parts of the brain. So different uh, populations of neurons in the brain whose activity is correlated with sleep and wake states. And this cartoon just, um, highlights a few of them that are down here in the hypothalamus in the brainstem. And all these acronyms are the names of these um, neuronal populations. There's the locus cerullus, the dorsal raphe, the tuberal mammillary nucleus, as well as their, the, the primary neuromodulators and, and neurotransmitters that they express, such as norepinephrine, 5-HTS serotonin, histamine, and then these areas in the pons um, produce acetylcholine. And waking is characterized by high activity in all these green and blue um, brain areas and higher expression of all these neurotransmitters that these, these neurons then project up to the different parts of the brain, up into the cortex and, high, and the higher parts of the brain. So that's what, so waking is characterized by, by sort of this kind of brain state. But during sleep, all those green and blue areas of the brain, they go quiet. Their firing rates drop down. They're, the neurons there are not firing very well, very high. But other areas of the, in other areas of the brain, the neurons start to fire. And in particular, one area um, that's been identified is this uh, VLPO, the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, whose neurons are, are um, uh, they, they fire the highest during sleep states. And what was, what was found is that those neurons in the, in the VILPO, they actually send projections to different wake promoting areas and they inhibit their action of their synaptic um, projections to those areas is that they inhibit the activity of the wake promoting areas. Now, REM sleep is characterized by the activation of some other populations, and one, one such population is this, these areas in the ponds, the LVT and the PPT, that express acetylcholine. Um, and so REM sleep um, um, is, is characterized by the activation of still some other, some other neuronal populations. So the, the idea, what, what I'll say is that many labs have been um, um, uh, investigating these different neuronal populations that are associated with wake and sleep states. And they've actually found, this is just a, a sampling of some of the populations that have been involved. They've, they've identified other populations. And there's also been a lot of disagreement about how the different populations are, are synaptically connected to each other and which ones are the primary ones driving say um, the, the sleep states and the wake states. However, so, for, but from, the, from the, um, these uh, experimental identification uh, of, of these areas, we were able to kind of boil down and condense an idea about a structure of a sleep-wake regulatory network down there in the hypothalamus and, and in the lower parts of the brain, consisting of wake-promoting, um, neuronal populations interacting with sleep promoting neuronal populations, as well as interacting with REM sleep promoting populations. So these two, these two cartoons are like our schematics of the most boiled down versions that, um, that we've been thinking about trying to, you know, get down to sort of like, what would, what are the core dynamical features of such, of such a network? And so they are, they consist of, you know, wake promoting and sleep promoting populations. I apologize if I've got, I've got it's kind of confusing color coding, um, as well as the REM promoting population. So this, this is, we would call this, this is what I'm going to call the three state model, because it will think it will try and replicate the pattern between wake, non-REM sleep and REM sleep, where a little more simpler version of the, of the network um, consists of just two states, a wake state and a sleep state and their interactions. And when one core component of these networks is this idea of mutual inhibition between these populations, 
that result in, in a flip-flop, meaning that when one population, say the wake population is gonna be activated, the, it'll be inhibiting the sleep promoting population to keep it from activating and then vice versa. Then they'd switch, they, they can switch um, activation patterns. And so in the in this simplest two-state model, we just have the wake and sleep states. We've got a, uh, the, here the H is representing the homeostatic sleep drive that will promote sleep um, if the wake promoting population has been active for a while. And then there's the SCN driven by its circadian, um, the intracellular circadian clock that will that that induces a 24 hour variation in the SCN's firing rate that then modulates the wake and the sleep populations. And then the same, and this is, we've got the same sort of setup here with the SCN um, and a sleep wake flip flop, but then we can, uh, there's been for the REM promoting populations, there's one, one um, hypothesis for how they interact is through with the wake promoting population and this kind of reciprocal excitatory inhibitory interaction. So these are the these are the, the basically the structure of the of the models that we've we've been developing and in in terms of how what what are we actually going to model we we use a firing rate model formalism so what we want to, what we want to model is the average firing rate in each of the neuronal populations and just to give you an idea about what those kind of equations look like. Um, We've been we've uh, set up a, a formalism that takes into account also the neurotransmitter um, and neuromodulator um, uh, concentration levels. So we if we've got a presynaptic uh, population based on its firing rate, it'll express some neurotransmitter, and then that the de depending on the level of expression of the neurotransmitter, it'll affect the firing rate of a postsynaptic population. So in our, in our most complicated versions of these models, we track a neurotransmitter concentration C that's um, driven by a presynaptic firing rate and it approaches a steady state um, uh, kind of activation profile that with this kind of saturating, saturating shape based where um, at, at highest presynaptic firing rates, we get the most uh, expression. And then in terms of how the postsynaptic population is going to respond depending on all the different um, uh, neurotransmitter inputs that it gets, it, it'll have a postsynaptic firing rate F that then is, is governed by a sigmoidal kind of a, a sigmoidal steady state um, activation function, um, which, is a, which is fairly standard for these kind of firing rate models. Um, so, so that's the general form of the equations. We also have equations for the homeostatic sleep drive. It's based on having an exponential increase during wake and an exponential decrease during sleep. There's, there's been some experimental results for the, um, this hypothesis of an exponentially decreasing rate during sleep and then the, the um, and, and then some measurement of those time constants for the, for the decay. So we have a little bit, we have some experimental data to constrain the time, um, time activity of the homeostatic sleep drive. And then for the, for the circadian clock driving the um, SCN firing rate, we've, we've modeled that in different ways, some simply with a sinusoid and others we've, we've uh, um, used a more uh, circadian clock type model, which you probably heard about last um, last week, that it can actually take in the take in light as an input to um, uh, to to uh, take into account the response to to light. Okay, so that's a general. I have a general idea about the, what these models look like. So there are these ODE models, and all right, I'm going to flash some equations at you really quick. Um, in the simplest case, they can be like four ODEs. Um, there's, you know, they're nonlinear, but coupled together. And in the more complicated case, they can be up to say a dozen to, to 14 um, ODEs, depending on how many of these populations we're including in our network. Okay, but I figured, okay, I'll just flash the equation that you, um, to give you an idea. And so what, uh, what is the solutions for these models? We basically get um, uh, different um, uh, time trace, time uh, traces of, of activation of the different populations and how we interpret what's happening is that whatever population has the highest firing rate, it'll pr be promoting that behavioral state. So here are some, some solutions for the, the two-state model where blue is the 
is the um, firing rate in the wake population and red is the firing rate in the sleep population. So when, when, that, when the wake population is high, we say the model's in wake. And when the, the sleep pro promoting population activity is high, we say the model's asleep. The green is the SCN firing rate with its 24 hour uh, variation. And then here is the, the, down below is the homeostatic sleep drive increasing during wake and decreasing during sleep. So that's the two-state model. In the three-state model, we have the same kind of behavior. Again, the color, the color coding is, is switched. Green is wake here. And then during sleep, we have the RAM activation where we, we, we can tune it to sort of be stereotypical human sleep, where we get four REM bouts um, over the night. And here's the SCN and then the homestead. Okay, so this gives you an idea about what these models look like. We've got these different interacting populations and whichever population is, is high, um, we say that that's the, that that's the, the state of the, um, the, of, of the model, of the, you know, whether it's in wake or in sleep. But um, so, and, and they can be, you know, you know we have a fair number of differential equations um, for them. But so the question is, so what can we do to analyze solutions? Um, so what we decided to do is we to look at this classic idea of a circle map, which was first um, uh, introduced by Arnold in the 60s, and then Leon Glass did a lot of work in, on, on circle maps. And so um, for those of you who may not be quite familiar, I'll just do a quick, um, quick sort of tutorial on circle maps. They, were, they have been used as a, as a tool to analyze the response of two coupled oscillators. So here in, in my cartoon, we can think about, we've got oscillator one coupled to oscillator two, and basically one is just driving two. So we've got, um, and they, they could have different frequencies. And what we wanted to track though, is what is their relative frequencies to each other? And what is their, uh, how, how are they oscillating relative to each other? So we can do that by introducing a section on in oscillator two's trajectory where we keep track of when oscillator two as it's as it's um, uh, during its cycle when is it crossing this section and then um, basically uh, mark the the think about marking the where is when oscillator two crosses its section what is the phase of oscillator one so here thinking about taking oscillator one cycle down here and marking on it the times when oscillator two crosses its section. And we'll call that say phi i is the ith section crossing. And then there'd be the, whatever the next uh, section crossing is phi i plus one. And we can compute in the simplest case, Arnold can, are, are in that original work considered a very, a sort of canonical circle map model that gives a, a map of this kind of shape if we plot the phase of um, the phase of the oscillator two section crossing, um, uh, but, uh, uh, the, the section crossing, the, the phase of the section crossing uh, relative to oscillator one cycle. So zero to one will be the, the period of oscillator one. And then the phase would be given by um, the, initial, the initial phase of the first crossing. And then the y-axis gives the, the phase of the next crossing. And then, um, and in this, in this sort of classic kind of uh, circle map, um, uh, we can see that the maps are continuous if we, if we include the wraparound um, between zero and one. And if we thought about, if we think about how solutions change as we change two of the, the primary parameters in this, in this simple um, setup, the primary parameters being the coupling K or the intrinsic frequency of oscillator two, we can, um, oops, there we go. We can, um, we get different kind of, phase, we get different phase lock solutions between the two oscillators. And in fact, if we define a rotation number being the, of the defined as the number of oscillator one cycles divided by the number of two section crossings in each of the patterns, we can basically find stable phase like solutions for every rational number. So here's the rotation number where we where one would be we have one cycle of oscillator two for each cycle of oscillator one, but then as the um, 
intrinsic frequency of, oscillate, of, of oscillator two increases, so it spins around a little faster, we can get different phase locked solutions with different rotation numbers. And in fact, we can find every rational rotation number. And then this, this bifurcation diagram um, uh, actually uh, makes a devil staircase or a Cantor set where we've got um, values at every rational number. Okay, so how, but how, so we, we wanted to do, you know, try and use this, this circle map for our sleep wake, thinking about where our two oscillators would be, the sleep wake cycle being the oscillator two and the circadian rhythm being oscillator one, which is driving oscillator two, the sleep wake cycle. Um, and so how can we, in order to construct a circle map or think about to try and get down to these circle map dynamics, what we did was we, we exploited some of the separation of time scales that are in our um, models that namely, if we look at the transitions between the neural firing rates, they're pretty fast relative to the more slow variation of the circadian rhythm and the slow increase and decrease of the homeostatic sleep drive. So we, we did a fast slow decomposition where we basically, where we took the homeostatic sleep drive and the circadian rhythm, well, I'll call it H and C, these parameters as fixed parameters and looked at what are the um, solutions to the, that our, our fast subsystem um, um, has for the different values of H and C. So if we, if computing basically the steady state solutions as a function of, a, of H, taking that as our bifurcation parameter, it, they trace out these Z-shaped curves where we have a stable solution at a high, here we're seeing where we're looking at these Z-shaped curves in terms of the firing rate of the wake population. So we have a stable solution at a high uh, wake activity. So that's representing the wake state. And then also a stable solution at a low value of the wake promoting population, but a high value of the sleep promoting population. So this low state represents the, the um, sleep state. And then they're connected with an unstable, uh, a branch of unstable solutions with saddle node bifurcations um, at the knees. And for different values of C, so or different values of that of the circadian rhythm modulation, the these Z-shaped curves change shape a little bit. They change where their where their knees are, their saddle node knees. And in fact, if we think about that, our circadian rhythm tracing out a 24-hour uh, cycle over the day with the actual. Um, uh, um, uh, steady state solutions form this surface, this Z-shaped surface where we've got the wake manifold at the top and the sleep manifold, stable sleep manifold at the bottom connected by the unstable um, solution. And then the dark line indicates this, these curves of saddle nodes. And so we can think about, and, and so this was for the two-state model where we where sleep was just this monophasic kind of or or like just a steady kind of solution but in the three state model what was different was that the we still had z shaped steady state um, solution curves as a function of the homeostat but during the sleep state we had had periodic solutions and so the these the the red and the purple lines here indicate the maximum and minimum um, amplitude of the wake promoting firing rate during the REM sleep oscillations. And so then there's still, we can think about there's still this three-dimensional Z-shaped kind of manifold, but the bottom, um, the, um, uh, this bottom manifold, this low manifold to sleep state is actually a sheet of periodic solutions for the three-state model. All right, so, so then if we let H and C vary, what we see is that the actual solution trajectories trace out a hysteresis loop over this Z-shaped surface. So this blue curve is the stable solution for the two-state model that transitions between the wake state um, and during the high values of the circadian um, rhythm and then falls off this curve of saddle nodes into, whoops, it, oops sorry. Uh, into the um, sleep state um, during the, and in the sleep state is, um, is at the minimum of the circadian rhythm. And so we have this um, uh, trajectory cycle 
And so this would be, we could think about this is our, our oscillator cycle that we want to construct the circle map for. So we can set some kind of section. And here, this yellow plane intersecting our 3D surface is a section at a value of, of um, the wake promoting population that we say that we can basically define as like as a sleep onset that when the trajectory falls off this curve of saddle nodes and crosses the section, that's what will we'll, we'll dictate that sleep onset occurred. So basically, based on the, um, we, from this, thinking about the dynamics of the models in this way on this surface, we can construct a circle map by setting initial conditions all along our curve of saddle nodes here and um, um, tracking the, from the first sleep onset to the next sleep onset as the trajectories move around this Z-shaped surface. And the maps that we get um, are look like this. So this is the map for the two-state model, and this is the map for the three-state model where I've just double plotted it in this, in this figure. And um, so we can see that the, for the, the one di defining features of these maps is that there's a discontinuity. So here, this map branch, it, it, it um, uh, goes up and then it wraps around here in this with, a, with an infinite slope on this end. And then there's this vertical gap, which indicates that there are um, uh, no sleep on, or the sleep onsets don't happen for some of these phases on the, on the second sleep onset. And then for what's different for the three-state model, we can definitely see there's that same kind of gap with an infinite slope here. But what, what the effect of having the REM activity is, is that it breaks up the map into a lot of other discontinuous pieces where each of these, on each of these pieces, if we think about the, the sleep cycle that, that occurred during the initial sleep onset and the, the subsequent sleep onset, those sleep cycles have different numbers of REM bouts. So here, here um, I think the, the fixed point of the map um, uh, that crosses this y equals x line, that fixed point has four REM cycles, but the sleep um, cycles with these other, that happen at these other phases, these have five REM cycles and six REM cycles, uh, for example. So these, so these maps um, have these kind of, they have the discontinuity, which can introduce different kinds of dynamics. And they also can be, the REM one in particular is non-monotonic. And what we find is that um, looking at like, okay, so what kind of bifurcations do we get um, in, in these, in these with, with these models? We looked at in particular, again, thinking about that, um, change in the sleep pattern over development, say from, from um, uh, you know, um, uh, from toddler sleep to adult sleep. Um, one thing that's, or one process that's, that's been known to change is the, the rate of growth and decay of the homeostatic sleep drive, because babies get tired faster um, than, than adults do. And so what we, what we looked at is in terms of a, the bifurcation parameter is a time scale for the homeostatic sleep drive. And, and not, not knowing exactly how the, the homeostatic sleep drive changes, because that's not exactly known. We, we, we looked as a, first, as a first step, just keeping the, the ratio of the, um, increase time constant and the decrease time constant, keep that ratio the same and then just scale both the time constants in our H equation by a bifurcation parameter, which I'll call K or chi in some of our, in some of the figures. So we're basically gonna make the sleep cycles um, go faster um, and see what um, uh, happens to the patterns. And so I'll show you, these are the results for the two state model. And so in this, this black stripe diagram um, on the left, we've got the parameter on the x-axis decreasing for faster um, rates of growth and decay of the homeostatic sleep drive, and then plotting what the solutions are over 10 days where the, where, um, the black indicates when sleep occurred. So we can, say, we can see at k is equal to one, we get one sleep per day 
and that one sleep per day solution stays stable as K decreases. Um, we see some slight variation in the phasing, the timing of sleep, but eventually we start to pick up solutions where we get more than one sleep per day. And there's a bit sort of, there's transitions into a, until we get to a stable pattern where we have two sleeps, then one sleep, then two sleeps, then one sleep, and then get into a stage where there's two sleeps per day and et cetera, we kind of see. And so we can define also a rotation number um, to characterize these solutions where we've got the number of circadian cycles in the numerator divided by the number of sleep episodes in the stable phase-like pattern. And if we look at what the, this bifurcation diagram of the rotation number um, looks like, we get what looks like very much like this devil staircase kind of um, behavior um, in this two-state model. So um, we can see that there's, it's not as dense, we, but it could, but it's, um, more, it's, it's a result of our numerical um, resolution because it does seem that there should be all the solutions between, you know, all the rational number solutions between, and we shouldn't be able to find those, those solutions with all the rational number rotation numbers. For the, so this is for the two-state model. So this seems, so this is, um, uh, uh, that behavior um, is fair, is, can be fairly well characterized. For the three-state model, things get a little more complicated. Here's the, um, uh, again, the sort of the stripe diagram showing the, the parameter scaling the time constants on the x-axis, and then the sleep-wake states where sleep is given by the, by the black, by the black bars. And so we have one sleep per day, for values of this of the parameter, but eventually, and that, and then here they're pretty stable. We can tell by the by the sort of stability of these black stripes as we go up vertically. But eventually, but as as basically as the the um, sleep wake cycles go are a little bit faster, the we we start to get some um, uh, instability in these in the solutions here. Um, even though we've got one sleep per day, but it's not quite a stable one sleep per day. And then there's a lot of more, a little more complication as we transition to the different, um, say, uh, um, alternating between one sleep and two sleeps per day. And then eventually we get into a stable two sleep per day uh, pattern as well as you know, more sleeps per day. And then there, if there the, um, here are the bifurcation diagrams for the rotation number where we've got the rotation number for circadian cycles per sleep episode. And then um, we can see it's a little bit, a little bit messier. Uh, the red dots indicate, indicate um, solutions where we couldn't in our, in our numerical algorithm, we couldn't identify a, that the solution was actually stable, numerically stable. Uh, but the black dots indicate where this, where we found the solution was numerically stable. So we see that there's a little bit of a winnowing of how many solutions we get but then we, we also defined a row, a REM rotation number as the number of REM episodes or the number of sleep episodes. And there we can see that there really is a lot of interesting kind of solutions happening that even in when we've got one sleep per day, so when the, when the um, rotation number is one, we have one sleep per day, the REM, this REM rotation number changes and it can change from having four REM episodes a day to five REM episodes a day, to six REM episodes a day, with and then and then with also solutions that alternate between number of REM episodes per day, and then and then we can see this sort of um, what another interesting aspect of this REM model is that there's actually bistability between um, some of the, in some of these transitions, in particular between when the one sleep cycle per day solution loses stability, um, there's actually bi-stability between this, these, these solutions that have six REM bouts per day and other solutions that have alternating two sleeps per day and different numbers of REM bouts. Mm -hmm. So things get a little bit, um, as it says, more complicated with the REM dynamics. And um, uh, we're trying to, we're, we're in the process of sorting some of those, some of the bifurcations out that we see um, um, uh, in the in the, this three state model. So, but where do the circle maps come in? The circle maps come in in helping us 
um, identify what is the actual type of bifurcation and what is happening in the model to cause the change in the sleep states. And so here, here looking at the, at the two state model, if we look at the value of our parameter where the one sleep per day solution loses stability, what we see is that how the circle map changes. So here's the circle map wrapping around, here's the, the discontinuity. And what we can see is that the fixed point here on, on the map, we start to lose it. And if we zoom in, we can see we're actually losing it in a saddle node uh, bifurcation. And we can also, see the loss of stability by tracking the solutions on our Z-shaped surface where red was our default um, K parameter value, bifurcation parameter equal one solution. And then the blue curve is where this saddle node um, um, is happening. Um, and so, so we can, so we can, what we can identify is that there's going to be some saddle node bifurcations, the governing loss of stability in these models. As, but we also see another type of bifurcation in these models, and we can see this particularly in the two-state two model when we look at when the um, row is equal to a half. So the two sleeps per day solution loses stability and or gains stability and loses stability. And so if we look at the, in this case, we can find fixed points for two sleeps per day on the second return map, where what we're plotting is the, given a sleep at onset at a phase, what we're plotting is the, um, the second sleep onset following, following the, um, um, the phase of the second sleep onset in the, in the map. And so when, when the two sleeps per day solution uh, um, first emerges as we're, we, as we're reducing our parameter value K, we can see that it emerges here in, it's hard to see here, we can see in this branch of the, of the map, the saddle node um, appearing. And if we zoom in over here on this branch, which is kind of the, the um, correlated, the correlated branch, we can see also a saddle node. So here it gains stability by a saddle node, but when we lose stability, so at a lower value of our parameter, when we lose stability, then we can see that the map branch actually is just pretty flat at the end here. And here's a zoom in here. And so we lose stability by basically the fixed point sort of falling off uh, the map and what's called a border collision bifurcation there. Okay, so. Um, just to, to, so hopefully I gave you an idea about the kind of things that we've been doing with these models. And so just to talk a little bit about what are, what we're um, the kind of the, what we're thinking about is, so we're in the process of analyzing these different bifurcations, governing the transitions from multiple, from sleep patterns with multiple sleep uh, cycles per day versus one sleep cycle per day, which happens when toddlers are dropping their naps or with sleep fragmentation and aging. And then we're, and we're asking the types of questions like, so how does the circadian signal affect these transitions? And in particular, how can it affect what types of bifurcations that we find and what types of, so how, what types of solutions we find in the transitions between um, monophasic sleep and polyphasic sleep? And in particular, can different light schedules affect the transition? So, so basically we can think about it. The circadian signal governs the, the curve, the edge of our Z-shaped surfaces. And when, the, when that, that Z-shaped surface has a different shape on the edge, it, it, what we find is that we can, we can change what types of solutions that we get and what types of bifurcations that um, induce those, those solutions. So I'll finish up just again by acknowledging my, my collaborators, um, Cecilia and Christina, and then also Sophia Piltz, who was a postdoc working with me for a, um, a, a few years on this work too, as well as funding. So uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Suresh, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Victoria, for the wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat channel and I can either read your question for you or I can ask ask it for, uh, or you can ask it yourself. I'll call out for you. <clears throat> yep, Dr. Glass. So uh, thank you. 
Uh, let's see, I don't know if, if I'm there, but. You're here. Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. I'm here, okay, good. Uh, oh, I don't, I'm not. Uh, Okay, now you can see me. Yeah. Uh, thanks for thanks for the talk. Uh, two two comments. One is uh, in some of these some of these maps, the rotation number can depend on the initial condition, so the rotation numbers can sometimes cover an interval. I wonder if you found that. Oh, um, depend on the initial the initial condition that yeah. you use. Yeah. Um, I guess we were, we were, let's see, how we were, whoops, sorry. Um, here, I guess I'm still here. Considering the rotation number, we were, we really, we were trying to um, find really the, the stable solution, but are you, are you saying, so we were defining it as, you know, just, I mean, we're doing this numerically. So we're running it until we reach what we think is the, a stable solution. But in that case, I'm, I'm ass we we're assuming that the any transients from the initial condition would die out. But are you thinking about that there would be bistability in the in the system? Well, or? maybe you should check some of Jim Keena's papers on discontinuous maps. Mm -hmm. If the map's not invertible, then you can have the rotation number not being defined for the whole map. Mm -hmm. It's you know, if the map is monotonic, right? Yeah. Then all points have the same rotation number, but in some of these weird things that you have, which are non-monotonic, you can mm -hmm. have you can have the rotation number covering an interval. So that was just one okay. one comment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your models seem similar to the models that Borbali was talking about a long time ago. Uh, the two-phase models. Um, a yes, lot of their work was done by simulation rather than thinking about it in terms of maps. I wonder if you've tried to connect what you've done with what they've done, or it, maybe there is not much connection. It just seems there might be. No, it is. It is true that this this two stage model, the two state model. So I guess we can. All right, I'm trying to get some picture that that will bring up this two state model. <clears throat> Um, so some other work by by um, some people at um, well Anne Skeldon and Jean Dirks at the University of Surrey they've actually done a from a two state flip flop model like this done a formal kind of reduction to this classic two process model of Borbelis which is this that the the kind of um, algebraic model of of a of a like a threshold system model where you've got the sinusoidal top threshold and the exponential um, the increase in decay of the of the of the other component. So they so it actually has been they've shown for well it, it's it's for a slightly different version of this of the the two state model, but they've shown the slightly different version of the two state model can be formally reduced to to the two process model. And so in that case then then you could do the circle maps and everything analytically from that from that two process model. Yeah, and so, but but we've but so we've been working with our ODE models, and then in particular thinking about how we can extend that. I mean, what I talked about today to this three-state model to figure to in, include the other um, the REM sleep. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, we have two questions from uh, Lucy Zhang and Bianca Granato. Uh, it's both about on the same topic. Um, do you know if the sleep drive is different in people? in countries that have midday naps or when the light dot cycles are very different, like in the north of Canada? Oh, okay. Yeah, so all these things are kind of, of, of um, uh, interrelated, but it's they're, what they're, uh, given the fact that the, you know, the biology of the sleep drive isn't completely worked out, that it's, it, there hasn't been identification necessarily of differences in the sleep drive. What's different, and what actually has a big effect is the, the, the circadian, the circadian drive. And in particular, like, um, uh, like up, in, up in Northern climates when the light is different and the light, um, uh, uh, the, you know, how many, how many hours of daylight that you get. It is, it is found that with different photo periods so different amounts of light per day, the actual, the actual signal coming out of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, it is either, it can be 
um, shortened, very shortened, so that in fact the 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 amount of time that the SCN has the highest firing rate can be shortened when you have short days and lengthened when you have long days, and so that's something. So the so it's 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 not understood exactly how that affects the uh, sleep wake behavior, but it's going to have an effect because it's it's changing um, basically these the underlying dynamics of the of the um, um, uh, sort of of the interaction. And in terms of it's just, uh, societies where there's a, where there's a midday nap, you know, it's, it's well known behaviorally that there's usually a slump in kind of circadian drive for wakefulness in the middle of the day. Um, so our, our, you know, these simple models that I showed today, we, we haven't included that, but we've got some other models where we're thinking about what is the, the um, how the exact firing rate of the SCN changes over the day. And in some of those cases, we can get a little slump in the middle of the day. And so it's thought that, that maybe it's that slump in the middle of the day that <clears throat> promotes that midday siesta. Yeah, I had actually a relate, question related to totally taking off on that very speculative. Um, so I was just wondering if there is any room for thinking in terms of optimality somehow. So what is an ideal? I mean, I understand there are individual differences and people have their variations, but there is the story that in the Middle Ages, early times, we used to have two sleep was broken up into two, right? So mm -hmm. is there room for thinking in terms of others argue that the siesta is a great way to do it. So is there some room in your work to think of some form of optimality in terms of how to organize these cycles? Oh yeah, we haven't we haven't thought about um, uh, any you know about control or optim uh, or optimality, but but I think you could do that because when a big you know the big as sort of our, our analysis has shown the the circadian cycle and how the circadian the cycle changes or the or the basically the drive from the circadian rhythm you know to these sleep wake um, populations. Um, that can change, and and it and it can change, um, um, uh, you know, when, when sleep episode, when sleep onset is most most promoted, or things like that. But yeah, no, we haven't we haven't thought about that. It's been interesting though, because we've 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 looked at these models, especially the three state model, in a lot of different kind of parameter regimes, and and what we and in some cases, what we found is that um, there can be um, uh, that in terms of there can be bi-stability of two sleep per day solutions where one of the one of the solutions is a midday nap and another of the solutions is is basically a a middle of the night waking period so it's like so so there is sort of enough complexity <laughs> in these simple models to to find different kinds of patterns like that e you know each kind of Two state pattern, but yeah, yeah, it, it's interesting. No, that's that's really cool. Um, are there other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then um, we've reached one o'clock anyway. So thank you very much, Victoria. That was a fantastic talk, and oh, um, thank you all for attending. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. Victoria. Yeah, thanks. Have a nice day. You yeah. too.